music at St. Peter's Lutheran College, where they founded the St. Peter's Choral. Gren is also a senior lecturer, choral conductor fellow, and master of music program uh, convener at the University of Queensland School of Music. This conversation, this dialogue, is actually in partnership with Box Camera Attack, by the way. I, that is a, 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 an institution here in Singapore where their main goal is to actually expand the pool of uh, composers and local uh, conductors. We are actually uh, also reaching out to many new composers now and we will um, <coughs> renew their works. Okay, these are uh, our students and they're here right now. And we're honored that you're here, Grant. In this same hall, we also invite you. Three years back, in this same hall, we also invited Dan Forrest, who's a dear friend of, of SCM. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming here. Uh, it's more than what I thought we were only about 15 people. I was talking to Dan Forrest about three weeks ago at the ACDA. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. So that was. First of all, I'm pleased to be here. This is really special for me because there are no church music courses anywhere in Australia. It's not possible anywhere in our country to study a degree in church music or even to do courses in church music. So what you have here is really special. And you heard a list from Yugi of all those things. The things that matter to me are my father was a Methodist minister. And I grew up in the Methodist Church. I've worked most of my life in the Anglican Church, the Church of England. The Americans call it the Episcopal Church. I taught, as you heard, in a Lutheran school for about 30 years. My brother was even more ecumenical. He's now no longer alive. But he worked also. Where do you want me? Just oh, because it's also uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think there we go. That's right. I, I love you. This is good. Yeah, okay. So you want me here? Yeah, I cook with you. Yeah, then oh, you can. Yes. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. You yeah. Turn it around more. I'm going yes. to come over here. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, so my brother was all the things that I read book in the Anglican Church. He, of course, had a Methodist father. When he studied in Los Angeles, he worked in a Presbyterian church and in a Jewish synagogue at the same time. And then he came back to Brisbane, where we're from, and he worked as a director of music at the Catholic Cathedral. And I think there can't have been many places in the world where one brother was in the Catholic Cathedral and the other brother was working in the Anglican Cathedral. That's where I work. That's St. John's Anglican Cathedral. And I see people nodding and kind of maybe thinking, wow, what a splendid building. It has a six second acoustic delay. Oh. It has a pipe organ that probably would cost $3 million to replace. But yet, look, here's a really old fashioned building. It was only completed 11 years ago. So it took them 100 years to build it, although you could worship it during those various stages. But it's a new building, but it's an anachronism. And you could see the towers of commerce and industry in those other buildings around it. And this church sits there. So it seems out of place. And if you know anything about the Australian climate, it is really out of place. Because on Christmas Eve, I will be conducting carols in a carol service. Some of you might even know the carol in the bleak midwinter. There are a lot of carols about snow and it being cold. I will be wearing a long sleeve shirt and a tie. I will have a cassock on top of that, a robe on top of that, and another level on top of that again. And I'll be doing all this. And the temperature inside the building is probably over 40 degrees. Okay. It is absolutely uncomfortable. But the point is, it says something about the relationship between the church and the community in which it lives. And I love it, and it's splendid, and I wouldn't trade it for anything else. But it is disconnected. So, let me tell you a little bit about Australia. I don't know how much you know about Australian society. 
but there were indigenous people there for thousands of years. The Australian Aboriginal culture is the oldest surviving human culture in the world, we are told. But the British came in 1789 to form a convict colony, a colony for British prisoners, because they didn't want to keep them in England, get rid of them. Nine months on a little wooden ship with sails to get to a place that you'd never even heard of. And you knew nothing about because no one else had been there for nine months to come back for nine months to report what it was like. It took a huge amount of courage for those people, remembering that it's not only convicts, but it's all the administration that has to go with how you look after the hundreds of convicts that you're sending. And the fact that Australia could become the country that it became with the people who were the people that England didn't want in England, the riffraff, the criminals, the, the people who would be outcast in terms of Christ, then you could see that there's something special. I think Australia was the second country in the world to give women the vote, for instance. It has always been a country with a really strong social con conscience. And while some of us might lament that it's not quite the country it used to be. When you consider its origins, it means something. In religious terms, the church is somewhat evangelical, and particularly the Anglican Church in New South Wales, and I don't think it's an accident that Sydney was the first settlement, and it's also now the centre of the most evangelical, at least of the Anglican churches. And why is that? Well, I think it's because if you're prepared to go across the world and be one of those people who leave behind the, the cultural slash religious life that, that is familiar to you and you love, then it's because you are prepared to accept responsibility for the development, the religious education, and indeed the salvation of convicts. That takes a lot of courage. If I love church music and I love the organ and the choir in Westminster Abbey, then I'm not going to come to a place where worship will be under a tree and then eventually in a tent. And one of our really special musical churches in Sydney, a church called Christ Church St. Lawrence, for its first seven years, they worshipped in the basement of the hotel. They didn't even have a place of worship except in what Australians would call the pub. Australia is a very secular society. I was surprised to find that 13% of Australians say that they would go to church regularly. And regularly means once a month or more. Okay? Now, I was surprised, not because it's as low as 13%, but it's as high as 13%, because I would have said it was about half that. But I checked the statistic the other night. Of course, after the British, society changes because things change. We are a country that has about four times the population of Singapore, but the land mass is the size of the United States of America. And therefore you can see that there's this amazing landmass that has hardly any population in it. And the phrase was populate or perish. So Australia has always then had significant immigration. The Chinese were actually among the first because they came largely to provide the infrastructure that supported miners who would flock to Australia during the gold rushes back in the 1840s. So Chinese were providing the shopkeeping, they were providing the, the goods and services that would support them. German settlement, really, really big, especially because in the 1880s and 1890s, there were lots of Germanic people who were fleeing areas like Prussia and so on. Greek settlement, the largest Greek-speaking city in the world outside of Greece 
It's Melbourne in Australia. Yeah. And then, of course, where others? Pacific Islanders. When I use the word slavery, I wonder what you think about. We think about American slavery. Africans who were taken to America to work in the southern plantations. It happened in Australia and in Wales. That sugarcane farmers in the north of the country, in the north of my state, would take our people from the Pacific Islands and make them work in cane fields. And while it wasn't slavery quite in the same sense as America, like technically they were free to return. They didn't have the resources to return and they didn't have the means to return. So they really were a captive workforce. Then it's become um, more recent that our governments have said, hey, why do we think we're European? We're actually an Asian country geographically. And therefore, we should embrace that. And so we now have a, officially a multicultural policy. And we have a huge amount of immigration and migration of people from Asia. And then, of course, there are lots of little subgroups, Korean, Samoan, Fijian, Nigerian, a lot of um, movement from Africa these days. And a lot of those people, so now we're connecting into, I guess, the point of, or the direction of the talk. A lot of those people will worship in congregations of their own cultural background. So they will usually attach themselves to a pre-existing building, a church that's there. But the church will have um, what might be called Australian worship at nine o'clock in the morning. But then at 11 o'clock, the Chinese congregation will come or the Korean congregation or the Nigerian con congregation would come and worship there. The fact that we have these congregations, of course, attests to the importance that there is a connection between forms of worship, forms of liturgy, forms of sacred expression, and our own cultural origins and our cultural norms and the way we think. There's one group who I haven't mentioned yet, and that's Indigenous Australians. And this is a really interesting and a really sensitive story, and you're hearing my spin on it, I will admit. So we originally thought of Indigenous Australians, yes, not yet, I'll tell you, we'll leave it there, but we'll play it soon. We originally thought of Indigenous Australians as primitive, backward, not able to be educated, not able to function in terms of European society. And that's actually true. Why? Because it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. You see, in New Zealand, the British made treaties with the Maori population. They had legal agreements that never happened anywhere in Australia. White people, British people came in and just took over the land and assumed it was theirs. They had the right to do so. And the justification for that has to be that you see the local people as insignificant. And so the story is that they were insignificant. They were primitive. They were not intelligent. They were indeed, and I don't like to say subhuman, but there is that kind of quality in the views. I have recently read a book called Black Eve. And if you're interested in Australian indigenous culture, you might like to find that and read it, Black Eve. I read it about five years ago. And truly, there's not one thing that I had been taught when I was at school about indigenous society that hasn't been revised or debunked. The whole story was not legitimate. It was the story that was made up by white people to prove <laughs> that these people should be treated in a particular way. And the story is horrible. Not only were they often massacred, my grandfather can remember 
and he came out to Australia in 1904. He could remember as a boy that black people were shot and their bodies dumped in the local lake. It is a horrific story. The white people decided that there's nothing you could do with Aboriginal adults, but maybe their children could be educated. And so we have a thing that we call the stolen generation, where black children were taken from their families and put into institutions so that they could be educated and normalized. That sits in the background. Thankfully, those times have changed significantly. But we now are in an interesting position with regard to indigenous culture and its connection to Australia and Australian worship life. And we're about to show you a trailer for a documentary of a rather interesting phenomenon, which is that the Lutheran missionaries, who were somewhat paternalistic back in the day, but at least very genuine in their care and love and support for Indigenous Australians, in their missions, they taught these people to sing Bach and Lutheran German hymns, chorales which in itself one might these days think about and wonder whether that's imposing a cultural norm. But they taught them in their own language, which is something that was a hundred years ago incredibly significant. And just recently, a group of women whose grandparents were part of this program have formed a choir and they've gone back to Germany taking back to Germany, Bach music sung by in, in Indigenous Australian language. Have a look. Mamma Candela, Liman Kanichana, Yimichada. Mamma Candela, Chamani Ringjara, Yetna, Naraka. Mamma Chuta, Mamma Chuta. Mamma Chuta, Mamma Chuta. Mamma Chuta, Mamma Chuta. Mamma Chuta, it's amazing what he's done. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I will ask you if you think that that sound is good enough to take to Germany. This tour by the film will be stopped. Amazon has a blast. We're taking the whole heavy screen back to Germany. If you see it, you can see it. You can see it. Tons of money left. So they'll be taking that back almost like a boomerang. So they know keeping our content and then we'll be strong. Doesn't matter. So you should go look for a film called The Zombie. 
but there's lots of stuff to think about that, isn't there? That it is possible to learn and embed in yourself and in your culture elements from another culture. In fact, that's important. That's what education is, surely. Education should be something that is transformative and that takes us beyond ourselves. I just also love the idea that it's kind of a thank you to Germany, isn't it? That we say, look, where, look, look what you did and look where it's ended up. And as you saw, they embrace this now as their culture because they learned it as their culture. So, so far, if you kind of think back on what we've been talking about, there have been kind of two things. One is the idea that a community might maintain the cultural connections it brought with it. Hence, an English, exact English cathedral, but stuck in the middle of the Southern Hemisphere uh, in a subtropical climate. Uh, or that there will be interconnection between cultural elements as seen in Bach, sung in indigenous language. I just, what might Bach himself have thought of that, I wonder? That all these years later, the music that was so part of him, the chorale, you know about the St. Matthew Passion, the John Passion, all the cantatas, that that music would actually be sung by people that he couldn't even imagine. Because in Bach's time, they might have known of the Southern Hemisphere, but they certainly didn't know of Australia. Okay. What about my work in Australia? Well, I think it's kind of summed up, maybe, in a CD which we have produced, which is called We Welcome Summer, Christmas in an Australian Cathedral, which, of course, is a surprise to the real, you know, the Northern European back over there in Europe, for whom Christmas is in the middle of winter. And it's the name of a beautiful Australian fix, New Welcome Summer. For me, the notion that's important, though, is that it's not a cathedral in Australia. It is an Australian cathedral. We want it to be that. We need it to be that. And, and that's something that we almost have to fight with. There are too many sub-stories, but let me just tell you uh, kind of um, as a slight conversion to give you context to this, which is that it, there's a book that I've got on my shelves, which is talking about English colonialism in Australia. And the last chapter is devoted to the fact that he argues that the last stage of colonialism was Britain exporting its music and its religious practices that go together to Australia. For decades, all the directors of the Conservatoria of Music in our country were British. All the directors of the cathedrals typically were British. All the pipe organs in the city halls, the town halls, and in the churches were British. And it was, you know, British dominated. In fact, even now, one third of the directors of music in the metropolitan cathedrals are Englishmen. And so where do we sit? Well, to understand that, I think we need to think of a couple of things. First of all, a cathedral is unique in church life. Like what makes it a cathedral? And so at one and the same time, I believe it has to be le a leader in liturgical practice and devotional context and indeed in music. And yet at the same time, it's not necessarily typical because we assume it has resources that actually aren't necessarily achievable in the local church, or maybe they, there are. I won't go into my background as a musician, but a lot of my professional life, almost accidentally, has been built around the promoting of the commissioning of Australian music. That sits there too. And there is, of course, the uniqueness of the Australian context. So what I'd like to jump now to is the text of We Welcome Summer. 
So there's a guy called Peter Skullful. He died just perhaps two years ago. And he was without doubt our leading classical composer. And he was one who actually set out to say that Australian music, not just religious music, would have a certain quality to it. And he tried to define what it might be. And what he said is this, Australian music will be sparse. It's not going to be rich and clean, like, you know, say, Russian music or the richness of Tchaikovsky or things like that. Not only because it's a different time, but because it's a different landscape. And he saw a very close connection between landscape and musical expression. Because he said, well, what else is there? We don't have a history because we've been ignoring indigenous history. We don't have a history. What is there? Well, there's landscape and it's unique. He said, Australians tend to talk on a monotone. If you go to Australia, you've got to get off the plane and you go to the airport and the news is on the TV monitors or something. And I'm sure you're struck by the fact that the news readers, but this is the Channel 9 news tonight and there was a car crash and there was a whatever and um, everyone is at war in the world, but Australia is friendly with Singapore because they're really nice people. Whatever they're going to say, it's not going to have a lot of modulation. And so our melodic structures won't be high like that. He goes one step further and he says, melody also won't have that type, kind of typical phrase shape of going up to a climactic point and coming down to it. Because we are a vast and flat land. In Europe, you've got the lowlands of Holland and the Swiss Alps in a really small space. We have that. We actually have a range of mountains in Australia and it's called the Great Dividing Range. It's the biggest joke you've ever heard because it's not great. It doesn't divide anything. It's actually not a range either. <laughs> Near my town, if you go to a place called Toowoomba, which is at the top of the range. Even in my car, and remember I'm a musician, so I don't drive an amazing car, I can drive up the Great Dividing Range in probably three minutes. That's how small it is. We are a flat land, and so our music will be flat. Maybe there will be lots of drones and kind of static harmony, and that will also reflect that flatness, but maybe it reflects indigenous music as well. So, Roger Cavell, who was a music critic for the Sydney Morning Herald, wrote this text. And I use this, it may not in some senses be typical, but in other senses, it reflects lots of things about Australian spirituality. First of all, if it didn't say Christ child in the title, you might not even connect it as a religious piece. There is a great ambiguity here, a kind of a lack of commitment. You'll be what you want it to be. There's an expression in Australia that says, she'll be right, mate. Okay, it's okay. But, but, but investigate it. The quilted sea is gone like rain, gone and never found again. A thin tree grows in starlit thirst, old and deep, and past all hurt. Green morning sleeps, the sky is so kind and calm and all alone. The Quilted Sea, this vast country, explorers, many of them lost their lives, trying to find what they believed would be this large sea in the middle of Australia. They never found it because it's not there. <laughs> or is it? The great artesian basin, there is water beneath the earth, the quilted sea is gone. Like the rain is gone, a double image because the rain will cause the, the sea. The rain is gone, the sea is gone, uh, but watch out because it hasn't quite gone. It's just beautifully ambiguous. Gone and never found again. A thin tree grows. There's another piece with a similar thing called nativity, which just has these images of out of barrenness, out of 
out of trauma, out of trial. There is new life, there is growth. A thin tree grows in starlit thirst, old and deep, faith beyond all hurt. Green morning sleeps. This new future is not yet revealed. The sky is so kind and calm and relaxed. When we put that with Skullthorpe's music, you'll find other Australian things in it. Can we go now to the score, but also to the music, please? And while Zink's getting that ready, can I thank Zink and Judy and others who set up this and made it work under difficult conditions? And can I thank you for praying while this was all going on? I know it was a distraction. So, no, the other piece, so the... Um, the morning song of the Christ Child audio file, as well as then the score of the two. Well, that's okay. Let's listen to it, then we'll look at the score. No, there was some in there. That's right. Just let's keep on going. So let's listen to it. But we need sound. <laughs> but just now the sound works. Don't worry about it. Fine. I'll play the music here. Okay. Yeah. I hope you know this on the pipe organ. All you have to do is flip a switch and it works every time. Okay. <laughs> on the piano, you just come and touch it. It works. Okay. With the human voice, you breathe and open your mouth. It works every time. Well, most times. <laughs> They're never solved. <laughs> Scrolling down through now for three minutes. Keep going in the Follow the general path you see. This one again, thanks. So what a simple piece. If you're following your own path, it's usually just a, a drone or a two note, but it just is repetitive like a drone is. And then this melody, it's not fast and dramatic. It's nothing like the music that I heard you rehearsing the other night for your concert tonight. It's of a very different quality. And if you analyze the melody, it goes ya da 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 ya da 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 and once it's established that note and that note, it just stays in that space. It doesn't go to a phrase shape and come down, as I said before. And there is something that's very Australian about that. And it's a sacred piece. Now, of course, 
I'm kind of um, choosing the quintessential elements. And there'll be lots of pieces that will sound much like your John Rasa and other pieces you've got. I have to admit the Hill song comes from my country too. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, so this is in many ways kind of quintessential. It's it's the distillation of the elements we're talking about. But we do find it in other places as well. One of our really top flight composers is a guy called Ross Edwards. And in a minute, we're just going to play you the, the Kyrie from his Mass of the Dean. And it's, uh, again, a six-part piece. It's fairly complex, but you'll just listen to the bass part, and you'll hear the influence. And you'll hear the influence of Aboriginality. Now, I just need to say very quickly that we are careful about this. Having been so exploitive of Aboriginal culture in the past, the pendulum has swung right to the other side. And so we are really, really careful not to be seen to be appropriating elements of their culture to dress our own art. When you come to Australia, when you go to the tourist shops, you'll find all the Aboriginal artists there these days will be authentically from Aboriginal people, not white people making copies of, you know, dot paintings and so on and decorating boomerangs in order to make money. We are very respectful of that. And as musicians then, there's an irony we didn't use their music before because we didn't think it was worthwhile. We don't use it now because we respect it so much or we respect the creators of it so much. And this is about as close as, as composers these days would go to actually hinting at Aboriginal culture. You all know the Kyrie, um, Lord have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, Lord have mercy upon us. So this is massive dream, just a little bit. This one too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The bass is singing one note to the whole piece. Yeah, exactly. It's problematic, of course, for conductors, isn't it? How do you reverse five complex parts and yet have the bass and sing the simplest part they represent? Yeah. Um, um, um. work was commissioned by my cathedral and the cousin because our dioceses both celebrated 100 years of, of their creation in the same year. And again, it's just an ecumenical statement that we would put together money for two problems. So that helps. Ross Edwards, and it's from a work called Mass of the Dream. And the notion of dreaming is again an indigenous notion. Um, the dreaming is the past, and particularly the past where in indigenous um, folklore of the, the world is created. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in Peter Stolthorpe, he's also written a requiem. 
and those two beautiful moments there where he uses an indigenous lullaby set in against the requiem text. Um, and that's rather lovely. Um, but that kind of gives you a context for not so much the music, like you can go and discover the music if you like, but maybe some ways in which Australians are thinking about how to be a church in a, in, in a land and landscape that seems to be so foreign from the origins of, um, of, of the church. There is a fabulous book, it's old now, there is a fabulous book that talks about the cultural life of Australia. It's the history of Australian cultural life. Now it's irrelevant because it was written in the 1970s and so much has happened from it. But the title is amazing. And it's a title that comes out of the Bible. And in the title of the book is From Deserts, the Prophets Come. Mm -hmm. And that's a literal kind of statement about the, the Arab landscape that is Australia. But it's a statement, isn't it, that is fabulous because it actually reassures us that often it's possible for real growth to occur in a place where there previously has not been preconceptions of what the future might look like. From deserts, the prophets come. And maybe that's an inspirational title to you as you go back into your church ministries and then work with, I hope, being sensitive to cultural norms where you are, but at the same time, seeing your role as transformation and leading people from where they are now to a place that will enrich and enhance their lives in the future. And I think that's probably all the time I've got. And that's probably most of what I need to say. Um, we were going to talk about hymns because Australian hymnody is a little bit interesting, but that is another story. And what I might do really has the files. We might even just send them out to you for those of you who are interested. But I guess I, there, I, we have three hymns there. You probably know the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. All Things Bright and Beautiful. And so there's a set of Australian words that go with that. I'm not fast on that, I must say. Because again, it's kind of like imposing on something else, something that kind of we want to make it ours. But maybe it is different once people are starting to sing it who never knew the original. Maybe. Then there are two Catholic hymn writers um, in Australia um, who, who wrote text and music. And so one of their hymns, In Faith and Hope and Love, is in this set. And you might just look at that, and they are universally typical, and they're just really, really beautiful. And then the third one is, again, an original text specifically for Australia, and a rather beautiful hymn, a melody which was written by my mentor, who was my predecessor in this cathedral, uh, a man called Robert Martin. So, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of this. If there are any questions, of course, feel free to ask. You might have some questions to ask, but we might be running out of time. I like your, your last statement that says that seeing your will as transformational in, your, in the things that the Lord will bring you, that you are a catalyst for transformation. Other people are saying that. Are there any questions? Yes. Is this Dr. Joshua, future, future doctor? Who I met the other night. Yes. Very, very brief. Yes. And I, I appreciate how you, you say that you respect the culture that much. But you try not to appropriate what is the elements, the mm -hmm. elements of the culture. How do you spread a thin line between appropriation and respecting by referencing that you say? I think that is the biggest question that could ever be asked. Because it's also complicated, I think, by another element which is that while I can be very sensitive, while my choir can be very sensitive, the people who are hearing or receiving that might not have the same sensitivities. And that complicates it significantly. Australia's best choral composer by far is a friend of mine called Stephen Lee. I spoke before about um, commissioning words. He's a secular composer. 
He has written a lovely set Santos and a lovely Agnus Day with additional text to add them into that. Very, very beautiful. But, um, but Stephen writing in the secular world was um, 20 years ago respecting indigenous culture by not taking poetry or syntax from them, but just taking isolated words. And so, you know, there'd be a song that would have a, a piece called Ngana, Ngana, Mangana, Mangana. And it just is saying things like the shark, the shark, the shark, water, water floods, the shark, water. It's not a poem. And yet even he is really criticised for making that step. What people don't realize is, I don't know anyone who is more respected of indigenous culture than Stephen, and he's got indigenous friends. And when we came to celebrate, sorry for all the answer, which is actually not actually the question at all, but when it came to the bicentennial, where we celebrated 200 years of white settlement, the Australian government offered Stephen a bucket load of money to write a piece in celebration of that. And he declined the invitation out of respect for his Indian friends. In other words, he is a man who is judged by his music without people looking beyond that to see what the man is himself. And so with that in mind, I think most composers now are saying, we, we won't cross that line to actually show respect because it will be misunderstood, we'll avoid it. I think the good thing about that, at least, is we have to acknowledge this is all a progression, and that will change as we are able to deal with the facts. I have friends who actually say part of the problem is that we're all suffering the guilt that we feel for the way we treated the Australia. And we will work through that as we actually deal with it. Oh. crucial for our students. In many ways, our students come from countries uh, where their music and their culture is, have been, uh, but they, they were made to think that their music and their culture is inferior yeah. compared to the West. And so as they come here, they couldn't figure out why we are trying to get them to promote their own music and their culture and their language. They're not getting it, but in, in, in many ways, as you shared, you're sharing with us, you know, these are some ways that you can bring back that culture that it's not inferior and yet also understand that you will be facing challenges. Fabulous, that's great. Can I just add to that? Yes. Yeah, I'm reading a book at the moment, actually, called The Musical Human. And it's really an anthropo anthropology book. Yeah. But he talks about the fact that he says the superpower that European music developed was notation. That's what made it different from Asian music, from African music, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that that has blinkered us to actually believe in the superiority of European music. For all the fabulous things about it, and of course we all love it, we don't want to, we're not saying it's not valid, of course it's not. But for all the benefits of it, he says, European music gave us an unreasonable focus on the score itself, on the music itself. And that Asian music, as an example, focuses on the people who make the music not the music. And you can tell me whether the example which I'm about to give you is valid or not, but he says a Chinese musician will perform music that is hundreds of years old, a traditional Chinese musician, will perform music that is hundreds of years old, and they will know the name of the originator of that music, and they will respect and faithfully reproduce it, rather than have this notion that, that European culture might give us, that for people don't matter. It's the work of art that is our focus. Mm -hmm. And that's, I've never seen it as explicitly described as that. And therefore, 
in your own view of your own music or other music. Don't try and compare it with your event music because inevitably we then have to make a choice of which one is better. But realize that they are parallel, but they are different and they're not competing on the same playing field. Okay. Any other questions? Wow. Blessings upon you all. Have a lovely day and best wishes for the concert tonight. Thank you so much. I love hearing your message.